Well, good morning and welcome to another Wednesday Reflection. It's so good to be with you this morning. It was great to be together this last weekend for Sunday worship, a great time of worshiping together and opening God's word and being challenged by it. If you were with us this last weekend, you know that we looked at the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness found in the first half of Matthew 4. And as I mentioned early on in that sermon, there were several different ways we could have approached that and ways that Christians have approached that passage throughout the years. One is just how do we, what do we learn from Jesus about approaching temptation in our own lives and, and resisting it? You know, we stand on the word of God and we choose God's will over our own and, and we choose the things of God and worship of him alone rather than the things of this world. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't spent time this thing this week thinking about God, where have I placed provision and my food and my daily bread above you is more important than time in your word and, and following you. Where have I chosen my job and my profession over you? Reflect on that. Or the second question, Lord, where have I put you to the test? Where have I said, God, you've got to show up for me in this way. And if you don't, then you're not really God. Church, I don't know about you, but I have friends in my life who, who did that at one point in their life. And God didn't answer the way he wanted to, and they've walked away from walking with him as a result, right? They, they set up, God, you have to do what I want, and if you don't, you're not God, and God said, that's not the best for you. That's not what I have for you, and will you trust me? And they said no. Church, the third one is those, you know, Jesus taking up the high mountain, given the offer of the world. Church, we are offered the world each and every day whether it's pursuing things in our career or off at college. And if you'll just pursue this college degree, you'll get this much money. Or if you'll just work this many more hours at work, you'll get that position. And look how much more money your family will get. Church, we are challenged and, and invited each and every day to, to make work or finances or our family, our God, and to bow and worship to those rather than worship to the true one true God who deserves our worship. So church, if you haven't, I encourage you to spend some time this week thinking through the three temptations. God, have I put provision in the things of this world above you and your word? God, have I put you to the test to get my way? God, have I worshipped something other than you with the hopes that I would get some reward that I'm not? So... I want to encourage you to ask those questions. What I also want to, though, is spend some time on, and I mentioned this in the sermon, is that we saw this really interesting thing happen in Matthew. You might remember Matthew 4.1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I told you I would talk about this this week because I think this is a pretty common occurrence where we talk about Jesus tempting us or, or God tempting us. And, and church, I think that's a really dangerous perspective. And I don't think I'm the only one. I actually think James, Jesus' brother, saw this 2,000 years ago among the Christians of his day, and he thought that was a pretty dangerous perspective as well. Let me show you what he wrote in the book of, in the letter from James, chapter 1, verse 13. James writes this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Well, church, maybe you find yourself asking the question then, well, if God doesn't tempt me, then where does temptation come from? Well, before I get there, I just want to say one quick word about the idea that God tempts us. I think it's a really dangerous idea because here's what I think it does. It, it takes the responsibility off us and attempts to put that on someone else. In this case, it attempts to put it on God. And if we think that God tempts us, then we begin to see God differently. God is not a gracious and kind God steadfast and faithful. God is the God, if he tempts us, that is trying to catch us, that's trying to trick us, right? Maybe, unfortunately, maybe you had a heavenly, uh, uh, earthly father, sorry. Maybe you had an earthly father who, he did that. He, he wanted to trap you. He wanted to trick you to show you how foolish you were, what an idiot you were, how stupid you were. Um, that's not our heavenly father. And James makes it very clear that God tempts no one, for God is good and God cannot tempt us to evil. God invites us to faithfulness, to follow him. But the same way that he doesn't force us to choose him, he doesn't force us. Uh, he doesn't place before us sin uh, and the hopes that we would choose that. God always desires for us to choose him. All right. So let's talk. So God doesn't tempt us. So where does temptation come from? Well, there's a principle throughout scripture that we alone are responsible for our choices. We alone are responsible. And this is why a lot of what's going on in the world today is so um, dangerous. It, it undermines these biblical, these these core biblical principles that that God doesn't, cannot, and will not make us choose Him, and the devil cannot and will not uh, is unable to make us choose sin. Um, neither of those are true. 
But what happens is that before Christ, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are inclined to that. That's that's where our heart is. Our heart is wicked above all else. And so before Christ, we don't have the ability um, to choose God, to choose his will, to choose Christ before him. All we have is the ability to choose sin. Now, we all know sinners who make some seemingly good choices. And, and that's maybe part of the, the image of God in them. Uh, maybe that's part of just them understanding that um, to survive in this world, you have to do some good to other people. But that is not a good that worships God. That is not a good that sees God as God. And that's really what biblical goodness and, and rightness is about. It's about God, uh, not so much about what we do. So here we are, we're dead in our sins and trespasses, and, and we're tempted, right? God is us inviting us to follow him, and, and the devil is inviting us to, to do that which is wrong, and, and we have a choice. And, and prior to Christ, our choice is sin. Our, our choice is not God. Um, but then Christ comes in our life. And God uh, enables us. We're able to see that and hear that invitation and see our need for him. And so we respond. And then all of a sudden, we have life in us. We have new life in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. And, and now all of a sudden, our choices are different. Now all of a sudden, with life and, and change in us and all of that, we can choose our Heavenly Father. We can choose his will. We can choose that which is right. And so the principle is still the same. God nor the devil can make us do something. We still choose it. But the difference is that God has now enabled us. He has empowered us to choose that which is right. The church, I don't know about you, but this just shows me the goodness of our Heavenly Father. God did not leave us on our own to, to choose him. God made it possible for us to choose him. And then he gave us his Holy Spirit and new life that we could choose him. And so then as we're walking with Jesus and we face temptation throughout the day, every single day, we now have choices. Are we going to choose sin? Are we going to choose the flesh? And the devil's still working to tempt us towards that direction away from God. The, the Lord is still inviting us to follow him. The differences here, though, are profound. Now we're doing that in newness of life. Now we're doing that empowered by the Holy Spirit. And now we're doing that no longer chained to sin, no longer in bondage to our sin. Church, I think sometimes when we think we're still in bondage to sin, though we know Christ and we've experienced new life and have the Holy Spirit in him, I think what's happening is that chain is simply laying over our feet because we haven't moved. But that chain is no longer locked around our ankle. We just think it is because we see it there still. We are no longer in bondage to sin. So temptation comes our way and we make this choice. And, and here is the goodness of God. Not only has he given us his Holy Spirit and he's given us new life, but God in his goodness redeems Tempt the sin of the choices we make. So here's how he does that. All right, so we're tempted, right? And let's stay in that temptation. We make the right choice. We make the choice towards God and his will and his way and in line with his word. Well, James tells us in James 1, 2 through 4, that that kind of faith leads to steadfastness. It leads to a stronger and stronger and stronger faith, like a, a muscle that's getting worked. We get better and better at saying no to sin and saying yes to, to the Lord's will and following him. And, and we grow in our ability and our strength to do that. That's part of maturing in the Christian life. But here's the other sweet thing about our Heavenly Father. Let's say in that, that, that moment of temptation, we, we give in a temptation, we embrace it, and then we sin, right? We, we actually give action to that temptation. That's when sin it, what sin is. And we do that, right? And we choose sin over God. When God's goodness, he doesn't leave us there, right? He's placed his Holy Spirit in us. We have new life in us. And that Holy Spirit convicts us and says, hey, you chose sin. You chose your way, God's way, the world's way, or sorry, you chose your way, your heart, the world's way over God's way. And that conviction then calls us back to the Father. We now have a choice again to say, oh, Lord, you're right. I did. I'm so sorry. I confess that I chose sin over you. And, and Lord, I repent. And I choose you. And, and we move back. And you know what? We get strengthened by that, even in our sin. And now next time, hopefully the Holy Spirit brings to mind what happened last time. I'm not choosing this time. I'm choosing righteousness. And we might fall back, but but here's the beauty of being a child of God. God doesn't leave us in our sin, nor um, does God uh, leave us on our own. It's like, oh, you chose me. Now you're off on your own. No, Holy Spirit's still are working on us. Now, we may harden our hearts to him. We may deafen our ears to him. We may say, nope, I'm sorry, I'm staying, I'm staying in my sin. And, and that becomes very hard to, to break out of. We build some habits and we build some ruts that, that are hard to break, though the Holy Spirit can do it if we will relent and bow our knee to the Lord once more. But temptation in the life of a believer is important. 
because God redeems it. Either we say yes to God in that moment of temptation and no to sin, and we strengthen and we mature, or in that temptation, if we say yes to sin and no to God, and we fall away, God restores us in his goodness. Now, if you think about what the devil does in temptation, he draws us away from God and he leads us to death. There is nothing good the devil does for us. There is nothing the devil offers us in sin other than a mistaken um, message that sin is good for us. Well, this is far too long already. But what I want to encourage us today, church, is the words that we find in James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Church, that's God's heart for us. That's my hope for us, that when temptation comes, we choose God, that we might grow in steadfastness and maturity, lacking nothing. But as James says a little bit later in that same passage, in those moments where we choose to sin, where, sin, where temptation gives birth to sin, that God calls us back and restores us, that, that God and his Holy Spirit beckons us back. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, God uses your sin to open your eyes to your need for him. Church, we serve an incredible Heavenly Father. And I guess that's what I want to convey to you today. I want to speak truth against the lie that God tempts us, that God's trying to trip us up. I want to help you and me remember and see the goodness of God, that he called us out of our sin that he calls us away from sin, and as we choose him, we grow. And if we, when we do sin, he calls us back, that he restores us, that we might grow more and more into the men and women he desires for us to be. I hope that's an encouragement to you on this Wednesday. Church, throughout today, throughout tomorrow, throughout every day of your life, until you see Jesus face to face, you'll be tempted. There is an enemy working to pull you away from God, and there is a Heavenly Father, though, there's placed his Holy Spirit in you and new life in you if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ to help you walk in faithfulness to him. And that same God who gave you that gift welcomes you back, um, calls you back when you do make the wrong choice and fall into sin. Church, let's be a, a people who walk faithfully with our Heavenly Father, who are quick to confess our sins and repent when we're convicted of them, that we might grow into the men and women God needs for us to be, to reach our, our world, our community, our family and friends with the good news of Jesus Christ. I love you. I hope you have a great week. I'll be out this weekend, but again, Jeremy's preaching and I can't wait to hear all about it. Look forward to seeing you when I get back. Take care.